So for an observer in rest, his time axis and his space axis look something like this. For an observer in relative motion, his time axis and his space axis look something like this. Now. The story begins a very long time ago when Albert Einstein gave his special theory of relativity. Two of the consequences of the special theory of relativity are so bizarre and non-commonsensical that it shocked the whole world. To understand that, let's look at two observers. So I have here an observer who is at rest and here is an observer who is in relative motion with respect to the first observer. Now for the sake of the video, let's name these two observers. Okay. Let's suppose that the second observer is traveling at very high speeds and we name him uh, Superman. What do you say? Because Superman can travel at very, very high speeds. So for us, the second observer is Superman who is traveling at very high speeds with respect to the first observer who is, let's suppose, Batman. So Batman is at rest in his bat cave or his mansion or wherever. And he's at rest while Superman is traveling at very high speeds. Now, if both of them try to measure the distance between any two events, let's suppose two events P and Q happen in space and time, and they measure the spatial distance between two points, then the distance that Batman measures and the distance that Superman measures are going to be different. They're not going to be equal. This is known as length contraction or space contraction. In the same way, if two events happen at different time intervals, Batman and Superman measure the time period between both events, the time periods are not going to be the same. This is known as time dilation. So length contraction and time dilation are two of the very bizarre and shocking conclusions of special theory of relativity. However, there is a particular quantity as I showed in my previous lecture on space-time interval, which is the same for both the observers. So if for two different events happening at two different locations and different time periods, both Batman and Superman measure this quantity, del x square plus del y square plus del z square minus c square del t square, then they are the same for both. So for Batman, this quantity and for Superman, this quantity are exactly equal. This is known as invariance. It means that this quantity is invariant under a Lorentz transformation. It's invariant under a Lorentz transformation because the measurements of Batman and the measurements of Superman are connected to each other by the Lorentz transformations. So this quantity is invariant under a Lorentz transformation and therefore this quantity becomes very very important and it is given the name of space-time interval. So one thing becomes very very clear from this sort of a discussion is that space and time are not absolute anymore. They are dependent on one another to describe the physical reality of physical events. In fact, I would like to read a line that was given by Hermann Minkowski almost 110 years back. He said, space by itself and time by itself are doomed to fade away into mere shadows and only a kind of union of the two will preserve an independent reality. It means that those days are gone where we looked at physical events only in the spatial dimension and time was a separate parameter. No, now space and time needs to be combined to create space-time where we can look at physical events happening in the universe. Therefore, it became very necessary to take the three spatial dimensions and the one temporal dimensions to create a four-dimensional space-time. So in this video, I'm going to first construct this Minkowski space-time and then we're going to look at uh, how the geometry of Minkowski space-time is different from normal Euclidean space. So normal Euclidean space has properties which are very much di different from the properties in Minkowski space-time which has a hyperbolic geometry and then we're going to look at Lorentz transformation. So essentially Lorentz transformations gives us an idea of how to relate the measurements of one observer to that of another observer. But let's keep in mind that uh, to make our discussion a little easier we are going to reduce 
the space dimensions which are three dimensions into one dimension and we are going to include one time dimension. So we are going to look at the Minkowski geometry which can be constructed using one space dimension and one time dimension and the conclusions we derive in 2D space time can also be applicable to the more general 4D space time containing three space coordinates. Now what is the first hint that we have in the construction of this kind of a geometry or rather what is the first hint that Minkowski had because he is the one who is given credit for constructing this kind of a you know space time geometry. The first hint is this of course that there is a quantity del x square plus del y square plus del z square minus c square del t square which is the same for two different observers in relative motion. So therefore whatever space time we create in that situation the space time interval must remain invariant under a Lorentz transformation first. Second, the speed of a light is constant for all the observers. So if the Batman that we have measures speed of light, he must measure the same uh, speed as if it is measured by Superman in our case. All right. So using these two conclusions, we are trying to do the entire discussion. All right. So let's first uh, 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 draw a 2D space time and make a little bit of a comparison with the Euclidean 2D space we have. Okay. So we have kept Batman and Superman here on the side, okay, just so that I can clear up the board for the discussion. Uh, so the one of the consequence of reducing the uh, total number of spatial dimensions into one is that del y and del z terms becomes zero, okay, because let's suppose that we are only talking about motion that is restricted to the x-axis and we are comparing the changes in the x and del t, that's it. So first of all, for Batman, this is a space-time interval del x square minus c square del t square. For Superman, his space time interval is del x dash square minus c square del t dash square. What is the space time interval? It is the measurements between two points in space time for two given physical events. All right. So we construct the Minkowski space time by taking one x axis or one spatial dimension and a time axis or a temporal dimension. We are going to use ct here because T has a unit of second, C has a unit of meter per second. So the unit of CT is the same as the unit of X, first of all. And second of all, there is a term that arises here in the space time interval, which is C del T. So it becomes very, very easy to understand and appreciate various things which are happening in this kind of a space time when we take the Y axis to be CT instead of just T and the X axis to be X. Now to develop clarity in what's happening in this space time, uh, I have also created the Euclidean space to the right hand side. So Euclidean space is just the how we do calculations in our normal day to day life. Uh, let's suppose in a 2D plane consisting of X and Y. The first difference that I want to focus on is this. Let's suppose that I have two events that take place here and here. Let us let the events be P and Q, right? And I want to measure the spatial distance between these two events. So I'll draw a line here a line segment or a vector. What is the length of that line segment? The length of that line segment, let's suppose is del S, okay? Quite obviously, you're going to tell me that, sir, del S square is equal to del X square plus del Y square. How do we know that? We know that from the Pythagoras theorem that if this line segment or this vector sort of projects onto the y axis or sorry x axis a distance or a component of del x and it projects onto the y axis uh, some kind of a component let's suppose del y then this is just nothing but a right angled triangle where the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the square of the other two sides. So del s square is equal to del x square plus del y square. However, if we do the same calculations in space time, that means I consider two physical events that happen at different points in space and different points in time and I draw some kind of a vector or a line segment between these two points, we already know that the space time interval should look something like this. So if I say that this is del s, then in the case of the space time uh, geometry, del s square is equal to del x square minus c square del t square. Now this is very much different from what we uh, have seen in the Euclidean space because if we look at the components of this line segment or this vector in the time axis and the x axis, 
then we have in the x axis the component is del x and we have in the time axis the component is c del t however the square of the magnitude of the length of pq is equal to del x square minus c square del t square so there is a minus sign here while in this case there is a plus sign here so what's going on well what's going on is this that in euclidean space to measure the distance between any two points we follow the pythagoras theorem but the same pythagoras theorem is not valid in minkowski space time the geometrical construction of space time is such that the pythagoras theorem which is valid in euclidean space to measure the distance between any two points is not valid in space time when we measure the distance between two points in space time in fact when we measure the distance between any two points in space time we have del x square minus c square del t square this is known as the hyperbolic pythagorean theorem which is different from the usual pythagoras theorem that we apply in our day to day lives in euclidean space so this is the first central difference between both these two kinds of constructions in euclidean space we follow the pythagoras theorem in minkowski space time the pythagoras theorem we usually know is not valid instead what we have is a hyperbolic pythagorean theorem now two things when we talk about distance between any two points in space or distance between any two events in space time i will be talking about the square of the distance okay because usually in relativity when we do the calculations in minkowski space time diagram the dis the distances are usually talked of in terms of del s square although in reality the distance itself is a square root of this right so here the distance pq is square root of this okay but i am not going to write the square root every time so when i am talking about distance between two points in space time i will be actually be talking about the square of the distance all right second of all you see that there is a negative sign here that means there is a positive sign here okay there is a positive sign before the space component and the negative sign before the time component now there are two conventions that are followed in relativity if you look at various books some of the books follow the convention of writing a plus sign before the space components and a negative sign before the temporal components but there are also other books that put a negative sign before the space components and a positive sign before the temporal components so these are two different conventions of using plus 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 before the three spatial components and a negative sign before the temporal component and the other convention of using minus 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 before the three spatial components and a positive sign before the temporal component both the conventions are perfectly valid and as long as you maintain a consistency of the convention that you are following in your discussions in your calculations you should be perfectly fine so if you do the calculations using the other convention perfectly fine i am going to restrict my discussion in this lecture as well as in the coming lectures to the first convention where i am going to use the positive sign before the space component and negative sign before the time component okay so this is the first conclusion that i wanted to convey to you that the usual pythagoras theorem valid in euclidean space is not valid in minkowski space time but to get a little bit of a more better visualization of the geometry of minkowski space time let us look at the line segments or vectors drawn from the origin okay so in the left hand side we have the minkowski space time diagram or the coordinate axis and on the right hand side we have the usual uh, euclidean space 2d space so let me uh, denote a point in euclidean space let's suppose i say this is a point p okay and from the origin of this kind of a 2d space i can draw a line segment to that particular point and this would represent the magnitude of some kind of a position vector to the point p yes uh, in that same way i can also choose a particular point in uh, let's suppose the minkowski space time uh, 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 graph and i can draw a line segment from the origin let me call this as o so o represents where x is equal to 0 and t is equal to 0 and from there if i draw a line segment to a particular point p let's suppose uh, 
then that would represent let's suppose a vector or a position vector but in Minkowski space time. Now in Minkowski space time any point is called an event because anything that happens in the physical universe if we can associate with it some coordinate of space and some coordinate of time that is known as an event. So this represents a particular event and this represents the interval with respect to the origin. Alright, so essentially this is nothing but x square minus c square t square. Let me write it down here. Uh, x square minus c square t square is the length of this vector or line segment and by length I actually mean the square of the length as I clarified earlier. On the other hand, the length of this particular vector or line segment is uh, x square plus y square. Now let me ask you a question. How many vectors or line segments can I draw from the origin in Euclidean space so that their lengths or square of the lengths are equal? Well, a lot in fact. Let me rephrase the question. How many points are there or what is the locus of all the points which are equidistant from the origin? The answer is very simple. It's a circle. So the locus of all the points which are equidistant from the origin of this coordinate system in Euclidean space is a circle. So there are a large number of line segments that I can draw here. Let's suppose I can connect these two points. I can connect these two points. I can connect this point. These line segments all have the same length. Now let me ask that same question but in space time what is the locus of all the points which are equidistant from the origin well the answer to that is revealed by this equation yes or no because in the case of the euclidean space the circle is in fact represented by uh, some equation x square plus y square is equal to let's suppose s square where s being the radius of that circle right but on the other hand uh, if I have some kind of uh, equation like x square minus c square t square is equal to s square then what is the uh, locus of all those points described by this equation. So if you are familiar with this equation this is nothing but the equation of a hyperbola. So if I draw this in the space time graph it looks something like this. So this represents the locus of all the points that is represented by this particular equation x square minus ct square is equal to x s square which means what that if I draw line segments from any one of these points with the origin they all have equal length in space time. So for example if I draw a line segment from here to here both of these line segments or vectors have the same length. If I draw a line segment from here to here or a line segment from here to here, so these all line segments or vectors between the points let's suppose P, Q, R and S have the same length. Now it may not look obvious to you because when I say length we usually think of spatial length. That means length in space but when I'm saying length here I mean the length in space time. So even though the spatial length of this line segment and this line segment is not the same but in space time their lengths are exactly equal. In space time the length of all these line segments are exactly equal. In fact the locus of all the points which are equidistant from the origin in Minkowski space-time is represented by this hyperbola. So this gives us some sort of a clue as to what we are dealing with, isn't it? In Euclidean space, the locus of all the points which are equidistant from the origin is a circle, but in Minkowski space-time, the locus of all the points that are equidistant from the origin is actually a hyperbola. And even though it may look like these line segments have different lengths, but you are thinking of length in spatial dimensions what you need to think of as length in space time all right now let me take the discussion a little bit further by asking you another question what do you mean by null vector 
You understand what a null vector is. So let's suppose that I, uh, I draw a vector from 0 to P in Euclidean space. This vector has some kind of a magnitude. The magnitude is given by root over s square or root over x square plus y square. A null vector would simply mean some vector at the origin itself. So if I draw a line segment from the origin to the origin, that would represent a null vector. It means that its magnitude is equal to 0. However, if I ask the same question, but in space time, what would a null vector look like? And now that is not necessarily something with respect to the origin because here there's a negative sign. So we can have s square is equal to 0 even if x and t themselves are not 0. So a null vector essentially is uh, vectors that are drawn along a line which is at 45 degrees with the time and the x-axis in both these two directions. Let me draw them first. So uh, any kind of a vector that is drawn on these two lines will represent a null vector. Why? Because you see that their slope is kind of in the middle of both x and ct axis which simply means that if I write down that in an equation let's suppose x square minus ct square is equal to s square where by null I mean the magnitude of that line segment or vector is 0. It simply means that x square is equal to ct square or c or rather c square t square or c square is equal to x square upon t square and uh, c is equal to x upon t. So the interval is such that or the vector is such that the spatial displacement and the temporal displacement are such that x upon t is equal to speed of light. So if I draw some kind of a vector here, so if I draw a vector between this point and the origin then this vector would represent a null vector because for these two points, let's suppose a point lying on this line and the origin, this length is actually equal to 0. Okay, so even though in Euclidean space, any kind of a visible line segment will have some magnitude because of this particular equation that s square always will be greater than 0, but because in the Minkowski space-time there is a negative sign here. There are certain situations where when x is equal to ct, the magnitude comes out to be 0. In fact, what does it mean the magnitude comes out to be 0? First of all, that means any vector or line segment drawn in these lines represents a line segment corresponding to having 0 magnitude s being 0 and also this is only possible for massless particles like light photon. So in fact this is the trajectory or the world line of a light photon because it is a light photon that travels at the speed of light. Therefore if I draw a trajectory, in fact in Minkowski space-time trajectories are known as world lines. So in normal uh, uh, discussions we talk about trajectories of particles through space but in Minkowski space-time, we look at the curves that, you know, connect the positions and time periods in space-time. They are known as world lines. So the world line of a light photon, which is traveling in the positive x-axis, and the world line of a light photon, which is traveling in the negative x-axis, uh, kind of divide this entire space-time into these two regions. All right. So in fact, the combination of these two uh, 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 world lines of a light photon end up creating what is known as the light cone. So right now we have here one space and one time dimension but if we create two space and one time dimension and we look at all possible scenarios of how a light photon can travel from the origin outwards then all those points can be traced in some kind of a cone. So this cone is known as a light cone because it represents the world lines of a light photon traveling at the speed of light. Essentially, it divides the entire space-time into two regions. Okay, so this is uh, one region and this is other region. I'm coming to that in just a moment. So the hyperbola represents the points equidistant from the origin, the light cone which looks like a wedge in a 2D diagram, but in a 3D diagram, it looks like a cone, represents uh, line segments or intervals or vectors having zero magnitude. 
and all the vectors can be drawn in the future but all the vectors can also be drawn in the past. So for example, uh, we can draw similar vectors having same magnitude but in the past. So it will look something like this. So essentially, uh, we can also have vectors which are equidistant from the origin but those intervals happened in the past, let's suppose. So these two hyperbolas are what is known as uh, representing time-like intervals. So let's come to the next topic of discussion, time-like, light-like and space-like uh, intervals. First of all, light-like is already clear. Light-like means two intervals that happen in such a manner that the spatial distance and the temporal distance between them are connected by the speed of light. So if there are two intervals that happen at particular locations and particular time periods, the spatial distance between them and the temporal distance between them is connected by the speed of light. So they can always be connected by two points drawn in the space-time, connected by a line segment that has exactly the same slope as the light cone. So those are known as if two events happen that have a slope which is the same as a light uh, cone, those are known as light-like intervals. On the other hand, if we look at uh, all the points in space-time above and below this cone, they are represented by what is known as time-like intervals. Time-like means that if there are two events that are happening in space-time such that the spatial distance between them is less than the spatial distance that light can travel in that time period, then that's known as a time-like interval. So time-like interval essentially means that S square is less than zero. So this is also another difference between Euclidean space and Minkowski space-time in the sense that the length of various line segments or vectors that are drawn in space-time can not only be zero, they can be greater than zero and less than zero. In Euclidean space, all line segments and vectors have a length greater than zero. But in space-time, any two uh, points can be connected by a vector or a line segment that has a length either less than zero or greater than zero or uh, equal to zero. So for equal to zero, those are light-like intervals that are the spatial distance and temporal distance are connected by the speed of light. But for time-like intervals, we have uh, 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 S square is less than zero, which simply means that X square is less than C square T square. That means the distance that light photon can travel in that time period is greater than the spatial distance between those two events. In fact, we can also say that we can always find some kind of an inertial frame of reference such that those events are not separated in space but separated in time. Those are known as time-like intervals and they are represented by these hyperbolas of blue color that I have drawn here. And on the other hand, we can also have what is known as space-like intervals, which correspond to those intervals where the distance between those two intervals or events is greater than zero. It simply means that x square is greater than c square t square, which means that if two events happen in different locations and different time periods, then the spatial distance between those two events is greater than the distance that light can travel in that same time period or it can also be said that we can always find an initial frame of reference such that those events are separated in space but not separated in time. So if I take any one particular event and I find out the you know uh, magnitude of the line segment and I like to draw all the points in the space-time corresponding to that particular uh, distance then we will end up getting two more hyperbolas but in the left and the right of the light cone. So here we have, here we have these two hyperbolic curves which represent um, all the points which are equidistant from the origin but the line segment having a length less than zero and these two hyperbolic curves that represent all the points which are equidistant from the origin but having a length or square of the length which is greater than zero and they are connected by basically events which we call as space-like intervals.
All right, so I hope that you are following the discussion. We have talked a lot about the differences in the geometry of Euclidean space and Minkowski space time. First of all, Pythagoras theorem is not valid in Minkowski space time. Second of all, all the points which are equidistant from the origin do not fall on a circle like in Euclidean space, but fall on hyperbolic curves in the space time. Also, the length of these line segments or vectors that I can draw from the origin to each of these points can have zero value. Representing a null vector can have negative value or positive value. So if they have zero value, they represent a light cone. If they have negative value, they represent physical particles or rather we say time-like events and uh, if they have a positive value, they represent space-like events. Which brings me to the next point of uh, uh, the constancy of the speed of light. See, one of the consequences of uh, special relativity is that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light, yes. So if you look at this particular graph that we have drawn, uh, the light cone has divided this entire region into two regions, all right. Already there is the future and the past, but there is this inside the light cone and this outside the light cone, okay. So essentially what happens is that if I have two kind of an events which are connected by some kind of a line that has a slope less than that of the light cone, it means that that can, is a world line that can be physically traced by a particle. So it is physically possible for a particle to create a world line that has a slope which is less than the light cone. And when I say slope, I mean the angle with respect to the time axis. So if I create some sort of a definition of a slope for an angle with respect to the time axis, then for physical particles that always travel less than the speed of light, their world lines will have a slope less than uh, that of the light cone. So they are causally related to each other. On the other hand, if two physical events happen in such a manner that if I connect them, their slope is greater than that of the light cone, it, mean, it means that they are not causally connected. That means uh, uh, no physical particle can trace that kind of a world line. So in a sense, the light cone also creates a boundary as to what kind of trajectories are physically possible. So if there's a trajectory, that lies within the light cone having a slope less than that of the light cone and by slope I mean with respect to the time axis then that's something physically possible but no trajectory or world line of a moving particle where the slope is greater than that of the light cone is possible because that would mean that the particles are traveling beyond the speed of light. All right, now that we have discussed the space-time interval, we have discussed some of the differences between Euclidean space and Minkowski space-time. We have talked about null vectors, time-like, space-like and light-like intervals. Let us come to the crux of the discussion, which is Lorentz transformation. See, we are initially interested in the calculations between two observers, right? There is Batman at rest and there is Superman traveling at very high speeds. Now, we know that their calculations are for the space-time interval are equal and they're connected by the Lorentz transformation. That is mathematically true. But how can we visualize that in space-time? How can we visualize the Lorentz transformation between two inertial observers in space-time itself? Let us do that. So before we talk about the Lorentz transformations, one small thing that uh, I have drawn the uh, points which are equidistant from the origin by these hyperbolic curves, let's suppose, for those cases where we have time-like intervals, all right. But if I visualize this in three-dimensional space-time, if I have an x, y-axis plane and a time axis, in that kind of a situation, this kind of a hyperbolic curve will be replaced by a hyperboloid surface, something like this. So in three-dimensional space-time, that's a hyperboloid, but in two-dimensional space-time, we have this kind of a hyperbolic curve. Now, so it's time to bring back Superman and Batman. So I kept Batman and Superman here to represent two observers, Batman being at rest, in this bat cave, mansion or wherever, Superman traveling at very, very high speeds. And I want to compare the measurements with respect to them. I have already mentioned that the space-time interval with respect to Batman is this, and the space-time interval with respect to Superman is this. 
and it's a very unique uh, you know conclusion of special theory of relativity that both their space time intervals are exactly the same under a Lorentz transformation. What do I mean under a Lorentz transformation? These quantities are related by what is known as the Lorentz transformation. So, Lorentz transformation gives us a relationship or a set of transformation equations of the coordinates of space and time between two observers. So, if we use these Lorentz transformations, we end up getting invariance of the space time interval. Now, that is mathematically. What about graphically or visually. So, how would a Lorentz transformation look visually in Minkowski space-time? So, we know that the space-time interval is invariant under a Lorentz transformation mathematically, but how would the interval in space-time uh, and its invariance under a Lorentz transformation look in the graphical representation or visualization of this kind of a space-time diagram. So, for that, let us go back to our Euclidean space. Okay, so if we go back to our Euclidean space, the locus of all the points which are equidistant from the origin is a circle. Now, this also gives us a hint to something else. So, let me ask this question. What is the transformation of xy axis such that the length of any line segment or a vector OP remains invariant. That means, what kind of a transformation of the coordinate axis x and y will preserve the length of a given vector. So, for that I have two axes. Okay? I made them specially for you and for this particular discussion. So, I have this two axes. Let us suppose one represents the x axis. Okay? Let us suppose that this horizontal one represents the x-axis and the vertical one represents the y-axis. Okay? What kind of a transformation of the axis will preserve the magnitude of a vector? Let us suppose the OP vector. Okay? So, if I have this kind of an axis, then the answer is very obvious. A rotation of the coordinate frame of reference will preserve the magnitude of the vector OP. Are you following? My question is very simple. What kind of a visual transformation of the coordinate axis x and y will preserve the value of the magnitude of OP? That means the length of OP. Is it translation? Is it something else? Well, the answer is very simple. In Euclidean space, it is the rotation of the coordinate axis that still preserves the length of a vector OP. That means the length of the vector OP in this coordinate axis and the length of the vector OP in a new set of coordinate axes is exactly the same as long as this new set of coordinate axes is obtained by pure rotation. All right. I hope you have understood this. Now, let us un ask the same question, but in Minkowski space-time diagram. What kind of a transformation would preserve the length of any vector? Is it rotation? Is it translation or is it something else? I am going to demonstrate to you that the transformation that preserves the length of a vector or a length of a line segment from the origin in Minkowski space-time under a Lorentz transformation of course looks something like this. What you end up getting is some kind of a combination of rotation and stretching of space-time in such a manner that the time axis and the space axis are slanted or inclined uh, with respect to the original set of axes in this kind of a manner. So, let me show you how that is possible. So, first of all, to uh, show or demonstrate this visual representation of the Lorentz transformation, I need to bring back Batman and Superman. So, let us bring back Batman, alright. So, if I bring back Batman, essentially what we have done here is that this Minkowski space-time graph or visualization is happening with respect to an observer at rest and because Batman is at rest, he is somewhere here, this is his visualization, okay. But space-time geometry is little bit different from Euclidean space in the sense that in Euclidean coordinate set of axes, 
an object at rest will be associated with a point. But in space time, an object at rest will have a world line. That means if an object is at rest, let's suppose I am at rest, that means my position is fixed, but time keeps on ticking, right? Time keeps on going on and on. So therefore, if I am or Batman is at rest, he is not moving in space, his world line will be this line. Do you see that? A Batman at rest will have a world line or trajectory that is a straight line parallel to the time axis. Okay, so anything and everything that is at rest has a world line which is parallel to the time axis but going ahead like this. Okay, so let's suppose that our entire you know, Minkowski's uh, uh, geometry is with respect to Batman here. Now the question is, what would the world line look like with respect to our Superman who is traveling at very, very high speeds? Okay, if Superman is traveling at very high speeds, you know, near the velocity of light, what would his uh, 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 world line look like? Well, if he is traveling at constant speed, with respect to Batman, his, uh, well, uh, his uh, world line will look like a curve, a straight line having a slope less than that of the light cone with respect to the time axis. So let me draw that first. So the world line of Superman looks something like this. So essentially, uh, when the Batman is at rest, his world line is like this. When Superman is traveling at very high speeds, his world line looks something like this. So let me demonstrate that a little uh, bit more. So Batman at rest, his world line is going like this. Superman traveling at very high speeds with respect to Batman is going something like this. So essentially, this is the world line of both Batman and Superman. They are going something like this. Okay. Now. What happens when you are at rest? When you are at rest, your world line is parallel to the time axis. And what happens when you are in relative motion with respect to another observer? Your world line is inclined with respect to the time axis of the first observer. But you are at rest with respect to yourself, right? That means Superman, even though he is traveling at very high speeds with respect to Batman, he himself is at rest with respect to himself. Let me elaborate. Let's suppose I'm traveling in a car and the car is moving at very high speeds with respect to somebody on the ground. But me inside the car, I am at rest with respect to the car. Understood? Two things. Superman is traveling at very high speeds with respect to Batman. So therefore, it's an inclined world line. But Superman is at rest with respect to himself. What happens to an object or an observer at rest with respect to himself? Well, his world line is parallel to the time axis, right? Similarly, Superman's time axis is parallel to his world line. So since Batman has this world line with respect to his time axis and Superman has a world line with respect to Batman's time axis, but with respect to himself, Superman's time axis is given by this. So if I want to do a Lorentz transformation, essentially this is the time axis which I'm going to call as C T dash with respect to uh, the original C T axis. So essentially this is for the observer at rest and this is the time axis for the observer in motion. So therefore I'm connecting the time axis of an observer in rest and an observer in motion. So you see that I have done the transformation visually speaking for the time axis of Superman and the time axis of Batman. Now, how would this inclination look like? So let's suppose that the inclination has a length of, I call it, or rather an angle of, I call it uh, phi. Okay, an angle of phi. Now, what is that particular angle? So again, we'll have to come back to Euclidean space because the, as you have already seen, Pythagoras theorem is not valid here. Various other things are not valid here. For example, if I vector in Euclidean space, its projections onto the x-axis, let's suppose this is OQ, 
and its projections onto the uh, y axis i call it or are given by you know sin theta and cos theta respectively or phi or whatever let's suppose i take this as the phi here usually the angle is taken with respect to the x axis but here i want to look at the angle with respect to the time axis so here also i am taking it with respect to the y axis okay so what is or okay if you look at this diagram or is nothing but o p cos phi right and what is oq oq is a projection of op on the x axis so this is nothing but op sin phi all right and what is o q upon or tan phi but this projection of a line segment or a vector onto the respective axis and their expressions are slightly different in space time in a sense that if i take the point or o origin here and another point let's suppose i choose p here okay so p can be projected onto the x axis and it can be projected onto the time axis so let's suppose i call this as o q and i call this as o r now unlike euclidean space in minkowski space time if this is the angle phi o r o r is actually equal to o p cos hyperbolic phi okay so o p cos hyperbolic phi here it was cos phi here it is cos hyperbolic phi similarly o q is actually equal to o p sin hyperbolic phi so essentially in euclidean space the projections onto x and the y axis respectively are given by sin phi and cos phi projections right but in minkowski space time the projections on x and ct axis are given by sin hyperbolic and cos hyperbolic functions of that particular angle clear okay so now from here what can we say so from here if i divide let's suppose oq upon or this simply gives us op sin hyperbolic phi upon op cos hyperbolic phi and what is oq oq is nothing but the interval of that event along the x axis so the spatial difference that is nothing but x what is or or is the interval along the time axis which is the temporal difference that is nothing but ct is equal to what is this tan hyperbolic phi okay now because this is essentially the uh, world line of superman he is traveling at very high speeds x represents how much uh, uh, distance he travels with respect to the time that he takes so essentially x upon t is nothing but v which is the velocity of superman so therefore v upon c is equal to tan hyperbolic phi so therefore now we have a relationship between two observers batman and superman uh, and the visual representation of their axes so if superman is traveling at very high speeds v and batman is at rest then their time axes will have an inclination or an angle of phi such that tan hyperbolic phi is equal to v upon c where v is the relative velocity between superman and batman all right so i think uh, this makes uh, the whole concept a little bit more clear that if there are two observers observer at rest observer in motion then visually speaking their axes will rotate in such a manner that tan hyperbolic phi which is the angle between the time axis of both these two observers is equal to v upon c where v is the relative velocity between both these two observers so this is the first step of constructing uh, a, a kind of a lorentz transformation happening in space time visually but this itself is not enough we also need to know what happens to the space axis well before we know what happens to the space axis one more thing see these hyperbolas are not drawn just like that they are drawn because they represent how uh, 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 the time and the space variables are going to change when we compare the measurements of two observers essentially the time axis and the space axis of some relative observer will trace out these hyperbolas so essentially uh, 
some relative observer his time axis will trace out this hyperbola and uh, for some relative observer his space axis will transform or uh, will uh, trace out this particular hyperbola okay so now to construct the x dash axis for superman we need to understand the second postulate of relativity the second postulate of special relativity says that the speed of light is a constant for all observers that means the speed of light for batman is c and the speed of light for superman is c that means if batman measures the speed of light it should be exactly the same which is c and if it is measured by superman it should be exactly the same so the measurement of speed of light for both of them must be exactly the same now this is not possible in pure rotation so if we do a pure rotation something like this if we do a pure rotation something like something like this now that is not going to happen because you see the 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 light cone the world line of a light photon how much angle it makes with this new axis and this axis is not the same so uh, to make sure that the calculations of the velocity of the speed of light for both the batman set of axes and the superman set of axes is exactly the same the new space axes will actually be so this is the time axis the new space axis will be something like this so let me first draw it first so these set of axes actually represents the uh, time and the space axes of superman as opposed to batman so so this is essentially what the axes of superman looks like as opposed to that of batman well for a batman his space time axis looks like this for superman who is traveling at very high velocities his space time axis looks something like this this is only for that situation where superman is traveling in the positive x axis if superman is traveling in the negative x axis his uh, 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 time and space axis will look something like this essentially all right so this is something that uh, is true for all kinds of observers having various relative velocities so if we increase the relative velocity between both the observers their space time axis will have greater and greater angles but of course the velocity can never travel beyond the speed of light therefore it will never reach the light cone and as the velocity decreases the angle subtended between them becomes lesser and lesser and when the velocity is in the opposite direction that is negative x axis the angle starts going in this particular manner so the x dash axis is uh, projected in such a manner that this angle okay this angle is the same at this particular angle that means the time axis of superman uh, and how, what angle it subtends on the time axis of batman is the same as uh, the space axis of superman and the angle that it subtends on the space axis of batman now i said that this is a transformation such that the speed of light is a constant for both observers okay so if i uh, uh, if i consider a particular scenario where we look at the motion of a light photon so as i already said initially the light photon uh, its world line will be represented by this two lines here and a light cone in three dimensional space time so if we look at the world line of a light photon and uh, with respect to let's suppose batman the world line of this light photon let's suppose has projections on the t axis and projections on the x axis so the projections are created or the components are created by drawing lines parallel to the time and the space axis respectively so for the light photon for the light photon we will have let's suppose some x in the x axis and some time in the time axis such that x square minus c square t square is equal to 0 with respect to batman but if i want to make that same observation with respect to superman then i will need to draw some So my camera shut down while I was uh, doing the lecture. It happens because the DSLR camera has a limit of 30 minutes and after that it shuts down automatically the video recording process. So while I was doing that discussion, <laughs> the camera shut down. But anyways, uh, 
uh, uh, I let me explain in continuation to that uh, that for Superman, if he is trying to uh, look at the uh, 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 light photon and its motion, then with respect to this as his axis and this as his space axis, a light photon will have projections onto the x dash axis, which will be x dash, and projections onto the t dash axis which is going to be c t dash all right however these projections or these components need not be perpendicular to each other so here i have drawn this vertical perpendicular line and a horizontal perpendicular line because in space or the geometry of space if we are looking at the components of some vector we draw some vertical or horizontal component right but in space time that is not necessarily the case in space time any vector uh, 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 which is perpendicular to some other vector need not look perpendicular but their inner product needs to be zero so if i have some kind of a vector like this and if i have some kind of a vector like this in the x dash c t dash axis if their inner product is zero that means they are perpendicular even if they do not look perpendicular in space but their inner product is zero therefore it means that uh, for a light photon its projection onto the x axis is given by when I draw a line parallel to the t dash axis and for the same light photon its projection on the t dash axis is given by if I draw a line parallel to the x axis. So this is t dash and this is x dash t dash. So as you can see because of symmetry reasons x dash square minus c square t dash square is equal to 0 which simply means that the speed of a light with respect to superman is also equal to 0 just like for the case of a batman. So for the case of a batman for x c t axis and for the case of Superman, for x dash c t dash axis, the world line of a light photon remains the same. The light cone remains the same. So this is what a Lorentz transformation looks like uh, from the perspective of the visualization in space-time uh, graph. So for an observer in rest, his time axis and his space axis look something like this. For an observer in relative motion, his time axis and his space axis look something like this. Now, we have talked a lot today, right? I want to continue the discussion, but I will do that in another video. So, in the next video, we will talk about further differences in space-time and Euclidean space. I will also talk about how we can use this kind of a visual representation of Lorentz transformation in Minkowski space-time to derive the conclusions of uh, 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 str like length contraction and time dilation and for that i have drawn these curves so essentially let's suppose that there is an interval of one here so the curve representing that interval of one is this 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 and this for both positive and negative values for an interval of two the second curve okay for interval of three the third curve so as you can see here what we have are these sort of units okay let's suppose this is unit one this is two this is three in the space axis this is uh, let's suppose minus one minus two minus three in the space axis and at the time axis i have one two three on and on and minus one minus two and minus three now these intersect at these points so it is at this point that one intersect it is at this point that two intersects so three again in the space at this point this point and this point. So as you can see here, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3 for x axis and c t axis, but in the x dash and the c t dash axis, the 1, 2, 3 units will go in this particular manner. The first thing that is obvious from this graph is that the length of one unit in x axis is not the same as the length of one unit in the x dash axis that leads to length contraction. The length in t axis, c t axis is not the same as the length of one unit in c t dash axis. That leads to time dilation. So in the further videos, I'll be talking about how we can prove length contraction and time dilation from the hyperbolic geometry of Minkowski space-time. So this is all in today's lecture. If you want to do a quick revision, we talked about the space-time interval. We talked about uh, how to construct uh, Minkowski space-time in 2D using one space and one time coordinate. We talked about the Pythagorean theorem, how it is not valid in space-time. We talked about all the equidistant points in Euclidean space looking like a circle, while all the Euclidean points in Minkowski space looking like hyperbolic curves. We also talked about light cones 
Then I showed you how a Lorentz transformation looks like visually. So for Batman who is at rest, this is what the axes look like. For a Superman in relative motion, this is what the axes looks like. So under this kind of a visual transformation of the axes of Batman and Superman, we can still maintain the two very simple ideas that I started with that the space-time interval of any two points in this must be the same for both the observers and the speed of a light photon must be the same for both the observers. So I'll continue the discussion further. That is all for today. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. I will see you in the next video. Have a nice day. Thank you very much.